Um, so the book chapter is uh, available and all the detail um, that I'm um, covering in the presentation will, uh, you can find it in the book chapter. So please do take a look at it, download it and share it. Um, let's get back to the presentation. And um, so I should say that it's, it's quite important to understand the, 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 the peculiarity of the political context for PB in Scotland. Uh, it's not that it's really different from other places, but it does have some features um, which are quite important to consider. Um, uh, in some ways, I mean, uh, some of you might remember that there was a, a wave of PB processes uh, taking place in England in the first decade of, of uh, 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 since 2000 uh, uh, until around 2010. And um, in Scotland, it didn't quite catch on in that first decade of the of the 21st century um the the political context uh, somewhat shifted in the last eight years and um it has allowed the space for pb to develop more meaningfully um partly to do with institutional factors there are some huge difficulties in scotland to do with the way um uh, local government is set up as you might know lo local government in scotland is um uh, well, essentially, uh, Scotland is one of the most centralized countries in the world, in the developed world, and we have um, only 32 local authority areas uh, for 5 million people, and which is in stark contrast to other countries. Um, just as a contrast, where I come from in Galicia, in the northwest of Spain, we have two and a half million people and 300 councils. So um, uh, th there's a strong contrast also with, with uh, uh, other countries, not just Spain, France, Germany, Finland. Wherever you look, you will find local authority areas that are smaller. And one of the prices we pay for uh, such large local authorities is that uh, there can be a disconnect between local communities of place and the institutions of local government. Um, so in that context, there have been for, for many years now um, a number of civil society proposals and developments that try to look into how to strengthen local democracy in Scotland. Um, there has been a, a growing level of civic activity all over the country in the last 20 years. This is a really vibrant um, democracy in terms of community action, in terms of uh, the world of social enterprise, the world of development trusts, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but perhaps the pivotal year, uh, the way we see it in the book chapter, the way we presented it in the book chapter was 2014. Um, in the run up to the Scottish independence referendum, um, civil society agendas uh, built on processes like the electoral reform society, uh, democracy max process, or some of the other um, um, sort of civil society organized platforms and reviews of governance and democracy were all pointing to the need uh, to reconsider our, our institutions of local democracy and simultaneously the Scottish government as well uh, perhaps inspired by the um, uh, discourse around devolving power from Westminster to um, um, uh, Scotland um, were also uh, in a situation where they had to consider uh, the issue of devolving power from Edinburgh from where the Scottish government sits and the Scottish parliament sits to um, uh, localities across Scotland and uh, those agendas Coming together created a window of opportunity where uh, PB became uh, a mechanism that, that was understood to help to go in that direction. And since then, there has been massive um, development in, in legislation terms and policy terms, lots of frameworks and, um, and legislation and so on. Uh, but it's important to, to signal this because, uh, you know, in, some people have the misperception that PB is, a, is something that comes from the top down, a kind of a national uh, government agenda. But actually, civil society were instrumental in putting PB at the center of um, demands for reform. So that's why in the book chapter, we talk about the interplay between civil society and, and government, both grassroots um, uh, action and, and top down uh, policy action. Um, and then uh, perhaps one of the things that made PB uh, viable in Scotland was that it was quite suitable to advance um, some of the key um, pillars that, that the Christie Commission on the Future of Delivery of Public Services uh, was putting forward. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the four pillars, 
partnership, participation, prevention, performance. And in the book, we explore how uh, PB can contribute to each of those. So I'm not going to dwell on that here, but um, it's one of those uh, situations where there's a window of opportunity in policy terms because PB was um, uh, one way of addressing some of the priorities that were emerging in terms of broader public service reform. And in 2014, quite importantly as well, in terms of policy developments, the COSLA Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy, COSLA, uh, for those of you who are not in Scotland, uh, COSLA is the Convention of Scottish Local Authority Areas um, and basically represents local authorities across the country. Um, the, the important, one of the most important elements of the COSLA Commission was linking uh, the absence of uh, strong local democracy in Scotland with the proliferation of inequalities, inequalities that affect our communities, inequalities of uh, 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 socioeconomic inequalities, as well as uh, to do with other uh, um, um, uh, aspects of inequality. But that link between a strong democracy and tackling inequalities was perhaps one of the core messages of the Commission. And again, the Commission did put forward um, uh, PB as one of the uh, mechanisms that might help uh, to change the situation. The Community Choices Program, which those of you based in Scotland um, have probably heard about, and um, this is the Scottish Government uh, national program to support and promote PB. Um, it is delivered by a number of local authorities, communities, civil society organizations, and across a number of policy areas. And so far, including um, the uh, uh, matching, the kind of fund match uh, by local authorities, it's reached uh, around 6.2 million, although these figures don't include the, the new money for community years. So like higher. Um, now, community choices has been uh, is still in the uh, is still mostly for uh, models of community grant making rather than mainstreaming. All the things are beginning to change, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but there is a large capacity building and, infra and civic infrastructure uh, program uh, to try and build the support and the kind of um, skills, capacity and workforce uh, to drive PB across the country. Um, I won't bore you with the details of this. You can you get check you can check the book chapter and that will give you a sense. Uh, but there are all sorts of things going on from a, a national network of pre PB practitioners, a national network of PB champions. They say there are working groups on various different areas. Of PB, there has been a training program uh, rolled out by PB partners, um, and, and a number of other things, including the the PB Scotland website, which is packed with resources, uh, as well as then evaluation programs led by Glasgow Caledonian University and and, and some of the work we have been doing at What Works in Scotland as well. Um, speaking of which, this was one of the reports we published a couple of years ago. We were looking at what we called first generation PB, uh, essentially the basically around 50 processes that use community grant making uh, as their PB model. Um, and uh, in the review, um, we were paying attention to developments before the new legislation and the new uh, policy support was being put in place. Um, so you can check the report in our website. Um, but in essence, what we were uh, looking at is how the first generation, uh, there, there were a few parameters that were central in the first generation of PB. Um, it, it was a time for experimenting and there has been a lot of activity all over the country. Um, uh, it was a fairly organic development um, uh, rather than directed uh, uh, from the top down. Um, all sorts of community organizations, community councils, third sector organizations and networks have been involved in driving it. Um, often depending on ad hoc funding, specific pots of money uh, available uh, on a specific uh, policy or service area. And um, it didn't require any form of institutional reform because it was to do with uh, small pots of money that could be uh, allocated according to some of the existing systems and ways of working. And the, the, there are limited evaluations of this first generation um, 
our review uh, was able to pull out some of the positive impacts, um, but uh, the scale of it was not enough to to make a, a significant uh, difference in terms of tackling inequalities at the more systemic level. Uh, and that's the hope for the second generation, which is where we are now. Uh, all the developments that I mentioned a second ago from 2016 onwards, uh, moving towards mainstreaming, uh, with all the policy and legislation and capacity building and investment uh, support that has gone into it so far. Um, the idea being that uh, alongside, and I stress that alongside, because this is not about doing away about, uh, with community grant making, uh, the small kind of community uh, grant making model um, uh, is still relevant, is still useful, and is still uh, um, uh, pertinent in, in many contexts. But when we talk about mainstreaming, we are also talking about expanding PB to mainstream budgets and services by local authorities. Um, and in essence, this should help to change the relationship between citizens, representatives, civil society, and so on. Um, we need to be uh, quite smart in the way we go about evaluating what's going to happen over the next 10 years, because mainstreaming should be able to make a stronger impact in terms of social justice. Um, but uh, the result of all of this activity, of the, the, the creativity and energy that a lot of volunteers and organizers all over the country uh, have put into this agenda has resulted in, in a massive expansion of PB. Um, before 2010, we could, also, we could only count a few, uh, a handful of PB processes, uh, whereas uh, the crowdsourced map of PB in Scotland, which is available in the PB Scotland website, uh, has at the moment at least 200 cases. And we know that there are cases that are not mapped there. Uh, so if you're involved in a case that is not in that map, please do go to the website and add your case so that we can keep an accurate picture of what's happening across the country. You can see in the map that a lot of the activity has been in the central belt, um, but there is also a PB spreading uh, all over the, the rest of the country. So. Um, and yeah, we know that this is an evolving picture. Uh, so please do help us to keep the crowdsourced map uh, updated. Um, there has been an interim report, which I think is really important when we think about mainstreaming and how that takes us in um, forward in terms of community empowerment, social justice, public service reform, and so on. Um, the interim uh, evaluation report that Angela O'Hagan and many other colleagues um, have worked on um, pointed out that so far, so far, and again, the final report is still expected this year, so these are not the final findings, but um, when when they put forward their interim report in 2017, um, they highlighted that PB is becoming quite established as a tool that is helping to develop uh, community cohesion, identity, capacity, social capital, and so on, but it remains fairly transactional rather than transformational. Um, and by that, they mean that some of the fundamental relationships between citizens and institutions haven't uh, yet evolved in the desired direction um, and uh, and that's going to take a little bit longer uh, than, than um, where we are just now um, so it's a it's a cautiously um, a, and critically optimistic interim report and we should look forward to the final report and see uh, where we are uh, with some of these initial developments of the second generation of PB in Scotland um, now, this final part of the presentation, I want to uh, delve into a few of the key issues um, regarding the mainstreaming of PB. Um, what does it mean and, and what are the implications of making PB a fundamental uh, process within our institutional arrangements um, and, and trying to make it um, a, a a substantial uh, and core component of the way we govern ourselves in our communities. Um, there has been a, a landmark agreement um, last year between the Scottish Government and the Convention of Scottish Local Authority Areas. Um, as many of you will know, uh, the agreement is that at least, and I want to stress that at least, because we wouldn't want anyone to feel that they are limited to this, they can of course uh, uh, go ahead with, with an even um, uh, more ambitious agenda, but at least 1% of all local authority budgets um, are to be subject to PB processes by the year 2021. 
And some of the estimates um, uh, talk about at least 100 million of core local government grant funding, both capital and revenue, to be influenced direct, directly through a PV. And we don't have so far too many examples of what mainstreaming uh, means. And we are uh, trying to work it out. I know many of you um, here in the webinar will be involved in thinking through what does it mean to mainstream it, to make it part of how our local authority works. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty across the country because um, this is a very uh, substantial change in the way we do things. And we have experiences from uh, previous initiatives that um, it does require a lot of effort um, uh, to put into this kind of culture change, changing mindsets, changing structures sometimes, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there have been a couple of examples um, that already point uh, in a direction that is different from community grant making. Uh, and in the book chapter, we talk about them Briefly, um, one of them, as you might have seen, and and by the way, well, is Dundee the sites in Dundee, uh, which I think has been awarded the, one of the COSLA um, awards this year, if I remember correctly. Um, what they did there uh, this year, earlier this year, is to put in place a process that involved uh, 11,000 voters uh, from across the city deciding how to spend 1.2 million of the council's capital budget. So this wasn't revenue budget, this was capital budget uh, through PV. And they decided to split the pot of money across the electoral wards um, and uh, any resident that was uh, 11 uh, years old or over uh, could vote through the online platform. And, um, and it's good to see that there have been uh, the political leader there, of course, was, was quite um, um, uh, uh, pleased with the process, it seems. And that's quite important because, as I, and I will mention this later, um, it, it's, it is crucial that elected members and local representatives are on board with this agenda. Uh, they, they must play a fundamental role um, in, in advancing this new space for community politics that is beyond party politics. The second example, which is something that has been profiled by PB partners, uh, and you can see the reference in the, re in the book chapter, um, it was a it was a very interesting case in 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 the southern part of the Western Isles. Um, it entailed the allocation of a transport budget of around half a million, and this was um, this was about uh, doing tendering the process of putting out a tender um, uh, to spend public money on a particular service um, in, in a very different way. As you can see, over two hundred residents uh, were uh, involved in in determining the parameters for uh, transport needs, and then the bus service providers took that into account to inform their tendering process, and then the tenders themselves were awarded by resident groups. Um, it was a really interesting process because it touches on something that sometimes people think uh, should be out of bounds for community engagement, which is the tendering process. And this demonstrates that, that it doesn't have to be that way. And it shows also a different way of uh, using a mainstream budget uh, for PV. Now, let me just wrap up with a few final slides on key considerations for mainstreaming PV. Um, and apologies that this is a little bit worthy, but I wanted to include enough, enough text so that those of you who might not be able to be listening because you're in a meeting, at least you can uh, read on the screen uh, if you don't want to go to the book chapter. Um, so institutional reform. Uh, the, the reason I mentioned this here is because, you know, um, there are implications. If we are saying that PB will be a key process in allocating a mainstream uh, element of, uh, or, or, or a key component of mainstream budgets, then um, this might have implications for procurement, for budgeting, administration, uh, for governance arrangements. Uh, and in some countries, this has required administrative reform to adapt the budgeting cycle so that it can accommodate uh, PB as, as a uh, as a core part of that cycle. Um, so it might well be that in some places, depending on how uh, uh, PB is taken forward, uh, this might require uh, rethinking and remaking 
some of the e existing um, processes um, in the budgeting cycle. This is something to bear in mind and something not to be scared of, although it, it can feel a bit daunting, um, but this is one of the fundamental elements in making sure that PV becomes sustainable and becomes part of how the system works rather than an add-on that can be removed uh, at the whim of, um, uh, 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 of of just a few decision makers who might not feel this is for them. If we want this to become part of how local democracy works, then sometimes in some places, and certainly those who are um, pioneering and trailblazing in, 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 in the mainstreaming of PB in Scotland might need to consider some elements of institutional reform uh, a key, another key consideration is to do with workforce and the, re, the interim report by Angela O'Hagan and, and, and colleagues um, was quite clear that um, too often PB activities are being added to uh, the work of community development uh, officers and community workers um, who are already fairly overloaded. Um, so uh, this is a really... Um, uh, this is a really challenging situation because, and perhaps one of the biggest paradoxes currently with the community empowerment agenda in Scotland, which is that, you know, we have all these um, uh, policy agendas around community empowerment, and yet our community learning and development departments, our uh, community organizing forces are, uh, in many cases, being uh, diminished. Um, um, we have uh, less community workers than we used to have. Uh, community work is often the first thing that goes when people are thinking about cuts. Um, that's a really um, uh, unfortunate situation to be in when we are talking about taking community empowerment seriously. Uh, PB requires community work. It is as simple as that, and therefore it requires a workforce that can fulfill the expectations of this democratic renewal agenda. Then uh, something very close to to my heart, and 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 that I keep banging on about, and and um, and I'll keep going on about it because to me this is what can make PB transformational. Um, PB needs to be more than just voting on a number of options. PB needs to be about the discovery and the scrutiny and the uh, development of. Um, initiatives and ways of solving problems uh, and ways of developing services um, that are based on evidence, on local knowledge, on the perspective of a variety of uh, uh, people in the community and in the system. And, and for that to happen, there needs to be dialogue and deliberation. There needs to be communication. Uh, so voting on its own, um, uh, I don't think is enough to make PB transformational. PB processes need to include dialogue and need to include opportunities for people to meet each other in the community and across um, the geographic areas where the PB process is taking place so that solidarity can be built and understanding of each other's priorities and needs can be built. Uh, so this uh, thing that we call deliberative quality is, is essential to any PB model, but for mainstreaming PB, for the second generation of PB, is even more essential because we are talking about public budgets. And that expenditure needs to be scrutinized properly, needs to be open to the perspectives of a range of um, citizens and, and policymakers and service providers and so on. Um, and that requires opportunities to deliberate, to sit together uh, and in the light of the evidence, try and make the best possible decisions for how money should be spent. Social justice is, is the other component that is at the heart of PB in Scotland, at least if we are to trust uh, policy statements and, and, and the ambitions uh, that have been put forward by civil society organizations and various levels of government in advancing PB. Um, and we saw that in the in the second in the first generation of PB, uh, those uh, um, fifty processes, fifty cases that we studied in our review, um, some of them had a focus on inequalities, but um, the impact has not been. Uh, uh, very large because, well, partly because we were talking about smaller pots of money, um, and, uh, and and that's part of it, but also because the focus on inequalities uh, wasn't always as strong as it should have perhaps been. So the opportunity for the processes that are going on just now and for the mainstreaming uh, of PB is to be a little bit more um, 
have a bolder uh, focus on social justice. And, you know, this is, it is about bringing the R word into all of this redistribution. Um, you know, the best PB processes, those that tackle inequalities, that help to remedy injustices, that redirect services and money to where it should be going. Um, they tend to have uh, mechanisms that build redistribution into the process. And you know, this is easy to exemplify. Um, there is a, there is a, a local authority that, um, uh, a few months ago, I was discussing the mainstreaming of PB um, with a number of counselors and so on. And they were explaining to me, uh, and I'm going to change the details because this was a confidential con uh, conversation, but uh, they explained to me that they had, let's say, a million pounds and they had five um, uh, different uh, areas within the local authority. Uh, two of those areas were highly deprived and disadvantaged. Uh, one was somewhere in between and the other two were fairly, um, um, uh, advantaged in many ways uh, where they were, they were not, uh, facing the number of issues that, that the other two, um, localities were. And, they decided that the million will be split five ways. So 200K for each of the areas. Now that is uh, problematic from the perspective of redistribution because the areas that are already well off will take that money and, um, and make things happen with it. Uh, but the areas that, that um, suffer a uh, disadvantage, um, that money won't make uh, necessarily a dent or not as much as it will make in the well-off areas that already have the social capital, the resources, they know how to play the game, they know how to get the stuff done. So a more fair distribution would be to split the pot uh, according to need. Um, so it's important when considering how PB is going to be organized, how to build redistribution into the way PB um, is built. Um, now, oh, lots of words here. I'm not going to stop too much on, on this, but just to point out the challenges before I wrap up. Um, and this won't be new to those of you who have been involved in community engagement work or um, uh, community empowerment activities. Um, over the years, but uh, some of these challenges are perennial and now they apply to PV. Um, there are cultural challenges. All of this requires a change in mindsets and ways of working. Um, and that, that means changing mindsets across public, third and community sector. Uh, and that's not always easy, as we know. Um, we know this from the challenges of applying uh, the principles of community planning. We know this from the history of partnerships in Scotland, back to the social inclusion partnerships. We know it from a number of other developments that um, show that Sometimes it's easy to change structures, but very difficult to change mindsets. Mindsets that have to do with sharing power, with having a more uh, facilitative style of leadership rather than a more traditional style of leadership and so on. Uh, there are, as I mentioned earlier, capacity challenges. Um, PB requires a very broad range of skills, um, knowing how to design a process, all the basics of organizing, coordinating, uh, building evidence into the process, the knowledge brokering function, obviously the more traditional communication element, communication and PR, and also the very um, necessary mediation skills and facilitation skills that have a massive impact in whether PB is an inclusive process uh, that really reflects the diversity of uh, communities. Um, there are, of course, political challenges. Um, you know, uh, it's um, uh, one of the biggest threats to PB in other countries has been the lack of cross-party support. In Scotland, we have an advantage uh, in the sense that um, Scottish Labour, the Scottish Labour Party, the Scottish National, Par National Party and the Greens all have uh, supported PB and they are all in theory, at least on board with PB. Um, that provides um, uh, some cross party support. Of course, the Conservatives are missing, but perhaps uh, that's something that can be worked on. Um, uh, the reason this is important is because um, otherwise, there's a risk that PB becomes a political football, something that only some administrations do, rather than this is the way the administration works, regardless of who is in power. So there are issues to do with making sure that um, 
there is understanding across political parties that this is about community politics, community values, community action, rather than party politics. Um, this also applies to um, existing um, communities of interest and community groups that perhaps had um, uh, had some advantages in the way uh, public money uh, has been allocated so far. And now that some of those budgets might be open to broader community participation, they might feel threatened by new groups and uh, the participation of a broader base of citizens coming into these spaces. Um, so we need to be aware that this can feel like a threat for those community groups who are already well established. And uh, it's important that they are brought on board and they understand that this is about broadening the democratic credentials of how we do uh, local budgeting. Um, there are, of course, legitimacy challenges. Um, we are in austerity times. Um, uh, austerity policies, it's um, kind of shaping uh, a lot of the, uh, well, basically most of what the public sector does in one way or another. And the risk is that PB might become a symbolic way of addressing some of the challenges to do with uh, administering spending cuts and so on. Um, so uh, that would be a tremendous blow um, to the legitimacy of PB. Um, and so we need to be careful that PB survives austerity times, um, however long that might uh, be. And, and then there are sustainability challenges. And this has a lot to do with learning about what we are doing. Um, uh, there is no perfect PB model. We still don't have... Um, and my sense is that mainstreaming PB in the next few years, we're going to see a number of models developing uh, locally, according to local context, to the uh, culture of a particular local government administration, to the needs of a particular uh, uh, geographic area. And we need to take that opportunity to learn from the variety of approaches to mainstreaming that are going to be developed and, and to make sure that we keep um, that learning, uh, uh, that we keep sharing that learning across some of the national networks so that we can see what works and what doesn't. And, and also that we create a space to fail um, and to fail positively, as in it might not have worked well um, um, uh, last year, but now we know better and we know what needs to change and we are given the space to make it happen and to take into account the lessons uh, from the previous cycle. And, and that's a space that is uh, precious and difficult to get. And this is up to some of the senior leaders in formal positions to create a space um, where learning is valued uh, uh, rather than just pretending that everything is just going according to plan, which seldom happens. Concluding, um, I don't need to tell you that PB is one of the most popular democratic innovations uh, around the world. If you go to the Participedia website, the Wikipedia for participatory nerds, such as ourselves here, uh, you will see lots of examples from all across the world. And, and th this popularity is due to the potential that PB has shown in other places for tackling inequalities, for addressing local issues, for improving governance, and for increasing civic engagement. Uh, but this spread across the world has also meant that there is uh, there there uh, the concept and and the practice of PB has had to be very flexible, very malleable, uh, because it had to be adapted to all sorts of contexts and logics and motivations and agendas. Um, this means that um, there is no standard mainstream model mainstreaming model of PB. Um, and this is uh, an opportunity and, and a risk. It is an opportunity because it allows us to make sure that PB is built on um, uh, on how uh, um, uh, Scottish communities want to govern themselves. Uh, but it's also a risk because it can be this this flexibility can be used by uh, some public authorities to uh, argue that they are doing PV while perhaps they are just doing a fancier version of their previous consultation uh, processes. So for me, um, I'm I'm I'm. Personally, and as a researcher, uh, I welcome the diversity of approaches that are developing and that are going to be developed. We are going to learn a lot from that. Uh, but we need to keep three key policy agendas at the heart of whatever model of mainstreaming we go for in each local authority. And those three elements are to do with public service reform, understanding that sometimes 
we will have to reform our local institutions and services so that PB can really contribute to making those institutions and services work better. Uh, it's also about keeping the social justice agenda at the heart of this, um, being bold enough to include redistributive mechanisms into PB processes, and making sure that the core component uh, of PB, the community empowerment element, is at the heart. And that means that in the end, it is citizens that make the decisions. Of course, in collaboration with institutions and services uh, involved, but with citizens ultimately making uh, the democratic decision uh, of how public money is spent. If we are able to look back in 10 years and we are able to say PB has helped us to reform public services in the right direction, to improve our social justice credentials, and to ensure that community empowerment is not tokenistic, but meaningful, and there is a real sharing of power uh, across uh, communities in Scotland, then um, we will have done our job. So hopefully that's where we're going to end up. Uh, but it really is up to all of us doing our bit um, in that direction. Thank you.